content has to be the foundation, you know, it's the heart of everything. It's that engine that gets everything going. So for us, we kind of view it as building our foundations for both brand and for search and also within demand. So our content team sits independently as their own, but they're very much hand in hand with all the departments. I'm Jonathan Gandalf and welcome to the Content Cocktail Hour, powered by The Juice. Our mission is to squeeze out the deepest secrets of B2B marketing professionals to help you push your brand to the forefront of the industry. Let's raise the glass. Welcome back to the Content Cocktail Hour. My name is Jonathan Gandalf, founder and CEO of The Juice and host of today's episode. I am thrilled to be joined by Carol Halley, CMO at Exclaimer. Carol and I first uh, crossed paths in New York City at an event, I believe, in a It's pretty interesting. You know, it feels like Exclaimer is and Carol's team are going on offense when a lot of people are playing defense right now in kind of a difficult market, investing in brand, rebranding, thinking about brand and demand. So we're going to hit all of those topics today. But before we do that and uh, to stop rambling myself a little bit, Carol, why don't you introduce yourself in your own words and share a little bit about your journey to Exclaimer and what you're up to at Exclaimer? Yeah, as you mentioned, I'm Carol, I'm the CMO at Exclaimer. And prior to Exclaimer, I was uh, for a long period of time at Skyscanner, where I led the B2B marketing team and really was with them through a very long period of time for seven years through to their sale and and sort of even after that. And then I joined a company called Canonical, who, for those of you who work in the developer sphere, you may know they run Ubuntu, which is obviously an awesome open source Linux system. So huge amount of um experience in terms of like both on the b2c and b2b side but also you know and selling into it and to marketing as a sort of two different audiences so you know that's sort of been my career today i guess i've always really worked in demand gen and growth and also you know strangely in in brand and product marketing so i guess bringing together my two loves as a cmo is kind of a fantastic opportunity to span those and all the other areas of marketing as well. But, you know, they're definitely the two areas that I get very, very excited about whenever my team's talking and things that it's always amazing to kind of marry those two elements together. And yes, uh, for as an exclaimer, I've been there for two years. Uh, we've grown from around sort of 35 million ARR and to just over 70 in those two years. So hugely kind of amazing journey, great sort of opportunity. And for me and my team, we've, we've grown from sort of a team that I inherited around sort of 10, 13 people to a team of sort of 34 now. So we're really big and scaled with the business, but, you know, a huge amount of work from there to actually establish the teams, build everything up, hire people, obviously. And then, you know, we didn't actually do a huge amount of kind of proactive marketing outside of our website and PPC activities. And and actually from the time that I've joined, we've launched, I think, nine uh, marketing channels, including things like social media, advertising, ABM, and, you know, obviously rebranded and built a new website. So huge amount of work, like 100 miles an hour for the last few few years. And I think we're probably now a good year of actually having functioning marketing channels, a team in place, you know, really starting to run at things. So it's been really fascinating and amazing for me to not only build my own team, invest in things, put in the tooling, but also, you know, run a rebrand and and be able to get such an amazing team on, obviously having the benefit of hiring lots of people too. So yeah, it's been a a great journey so far. That type of growth, again, kind of in this challenging market, knowing what Exclaimer does and and who you sell to is, is very impressive. So congratulations to you and the team. You're running 100 miles an hour, but it is working. (laughs) uh, So that's very exciting. Well, Carol, before we jump into all of that, which I'm really eager to, this is the Content Cocktail Hour. We always like asking our guests, what are you enjoying drinking nowadays? Obviously, I'm from the north of England, so obviously drink a vast amount of tea. But in terms of enjoying, like, my favorite is a spicy margarita, so that's definitely what I'd be having at the weekend. I love that. I love a good spicy margarita. I may have to get one of those this evening as we're recording on a Friday. But let's jump in. You mentioned you kind of have this unique balance of brand and demand background and you love the CMO seat because you, you kind of get perspective and, and oversight into both of those. We as marketers, myself included, I think so often we talk about those um, very binary, those brand being one thing, demand being another. And if you get lucky, there, there's some overlap or some cohesion between the two. But you've invested in brand very heavily. You're driving demand very clearly. From your CMO seat and that exclaimer, like how do you think about the balance or the, the harmony between those two versus them working independently? 
there's a bit of a, I guess, a backstory to some of my thinking, but I think there's been some really fascinating trends over the the last sort of few years that we could probably touch on around kind of how that has impacted and how that has changed how important I believe brand will be as we go forward. And actually, I think it will be, you know, for many companies, a real secret weapon from 2024 into 2025. And I think if you build that brand trust, everything else is going to start to follow. Because if you focus in awareness and trust and transparency behind everything you do, you start to kind of really start to look at things differently. And then you work on, you know, how do you build an emotional connection? How do you be present where people are actually searching and doing business, which has fundamentally shifted, I think, over the past few years. So to wind back and sort of go into a bit more detail on that, when you look at, you know, over the last, I guess, sort of three, four years since COVID, really, we were at a position where, you know, budgets were growing, people were having more as a percentage to invest in, there was an awful lot of, you know, SaaS valuations, a lot of sales, a lot of things happening that was, you know, really, really amazing. And it was a bit of a growth at all costs opportunity, which obviously as a marketer, you know, we benefited, we had good budgets, everything was wonderful, the world was rosy. And then sort of from COVID, you kind of saw a massive dip in terms of percentage of a company's revenue that was being invested in marketing. And at the same time, a lot of kind of digitalization opportunities with online advertising and things. So we actually went online, which was fascinating. And we also became more and more capable of attribution, which was also an incredible journey to be on as a as a marketer. And so, you know, we'd got to this point where people actually could invest in ROI and attributable, you know, channels. And we started to kind of, I guess, divide every channel up as a as a different individual thing where we looked at performance and started to lose a little bit of the the kind of idea of investing in brand. And you saw people, you know, really heavily switch their budgets into into advertising. And I'm, I'm definitely one of the people who did that as well. And there was great opportunities in that. And you, know, you kind of got to that point. And then it started to kind of, I guess, tap out and tail off to a degree, you know, more and more competition, more and more people investing in that you know we've not seen those budgets go back up but we've also then seen as a result this massive underinvestment in brand because people couldn't prove it like you had to have a harder argument than to say well I need you know a couple of hundred grand to go and invest in some ads and then give you an ROI of x rather than you know I'll invest in this activity and in a couple of years the position is in an amazing place but I can't quite tell you exactly what that means. And obviously, every self-respecting CFO would be on your bike and, you know, come back when you've got a better answer. So this obviously has happened and not for, you know, bad reason in a sense, but it has caused this massive underinvestment in brand because you kind of didn't need to, but also because people couldn't prove it. And so it's become a challenge for marketers. But then, you know, that's also by default caused a huge amount of buying difference. You know, people aren't coming to your website. I think there's a fascinating report from Sixth Sense that shows shows people are going 70 to 80 percent through their buying journey so the whole of awareness the whole of consideration is being done before you or certainly has become aware of people so they're coming to us more and more especially at higher deal sizes saying you know I've done my research I've decided I'm going to buy you I've decided that you know I, I want you but prove me wrong and people are coming more with that mentality as I guess an incumbent in our sector and it's it's quite good because you know we're with a bigger player, we're respected, we're trusted, and we've worked really hard in to be in that position. But you know, we've also now got to work really hard with great content, with making sure that we're there in review sites, that we have people reviewing us, that we're also featured in the press and PR, that we're parts of communities. Because I know, you know, and I'm probably the worst. I do my research myself, and I don't have cookies on my browsers, and then I ask for advice in a CMO group that I absolutely love, and you know, various other elements, and I will literally say to my team, I think we should buy this like tell me I'm wrong and we'll go off and do the research and they'll do the research and then they'll tell me whether you know it's wrong or it right so that's how people are doing so if this is changing you need to be in the conversations you need to be in the the websites that are reviewing you You need to be trusted you need to be present and you can't do that with just buying advertising so it's a massive sort of shift and I guess as well the wonderful generational AI so you can deliver this awful content at scale and everything's going out and everyone's happening and so for us AI is amazing to help us go through that conversion and accelerate conversion and operate at scale personalize at scale it's wonderful but in terms of the amount of volume of of stuff we have to compete with it's so challenging so I think that investment in brand has a huge opportunity as we go forward to actually be actually ROI attributable because you won't be getting the results that you do have. So you look at kind of what people are looking at. They like to do things hands on. They love free trials. So, you know, we saw this. So we built our own free trial. We work with Novatic on our site. They want demo. They want to read the content, not necessarily even on your site, but, you know, it's making all of these things available within that. And you've got to sort of completely shift your mindset. 
so that's what we've kind of seen as, as trends that we've started to kind of change our marketing approach to accommodate and capitalize on, and I guess future proof as well. Yeah, I've heard it referred to as like, you know, the dark funnel, dark social, whatever it is. But just as you mentioned, like, you know, you're going to your peers and communities, you're going to private communities, you're, you're just doing real life research at events, talking to people, you know, having those conversations. And none of that's ever going to be attributable. But without brand, it's also not going to happen. So I think that's very insightful. And I, I love the the stat you mentioned on how much self-education is is happening in the buying journey. And I've seen that same stat where it's like, you know, 80% of the buying journey is done before they ever engage with any sales individuals from it anywhere. And a lot of times the decision is already made. They're just looking to validate or potentially invalidate that decision. So then I'm curious on, on that point, you know, content has to play such a, a critical role in that journey. From the CMOC, how do you think about content? Does it sit in brand? Does it sit in demand? And how do you measure success of content from your seat? Content has to be like almost like the the foundation, you know, it's the heart of everything. It's that engine that sort of gets everything going. And so for us, we kind of view it as building our foundations for both brand and for search and also, you know, within demand. So our content team sits independently as as their own, but they're very much in, you know, hand in hand with all the departments and you know, the demand gen team will kind of be in market and they'll suddenly be like, you yeah, know, this is an amazing opportunity. And they'll work together to get something out really, really quickly, or we'll have something planned from a, a content perspective on the calendar. But I think it's really important to be always on for all your audiences with, you know, really relevant content. And I think um, we're part of a insights group. So they invest in us as our main investor, it's a private equity firm. Um, and they produced a fantastic report that's really interesting to sort of say, actually, there's like five key table stakes thing that 100% of companies really, it was done in a B2B SaaS world. So I think they surveyed around 500 B2B SaaS companies sort of say, well, what are you investing in? And it's like things like blog posts, research reports, white papers, case studies, you know, FAQ glossaries, webinars. These are like their consideration of table stakes. Like everyone is doing this. And if you're not doing it, you know, you're not not cool, but you're also probably not going to get results. But then they sort of did a really interesting thing that we obviously got at the beginning of this year and helped us shift our approach. But they were saying, you know, at the different stages, like to 1 million and 10 to 50 million and 50 million plus ARR, actually people aren't doing certain things. And it depends whether you're targeting, I guess, enterprise or other areas. But for us in our segment, you know, we noticed that actually there wasn't as many people doing things like product tutorials and online tutorials. So we built one of those for our site. You know, there wasn't as many people doing interactive content and having ROI calculators to tell people, you know, as they're doing this research, you know, can you tell them the value of your product really quickly and easily to help them with their decision to come to you? And so we built that on ours and things like third party research reports. You know, we noticed that actually lots of people were doing first party content, but they weren't really focusing on that. And you also review sites for us was a massive investment this year. So we were like, actually, if people aren't researching on our site, how do we make sure that we get our customers, we mobilize our customers, really focus on that customer centric growth idea so that, you know, not only are we getting reviews telling us we need to improve because then we can improve but reviews saying you know if we do something well and responding to them and making it very clear that we care about that and we're a good person to do business with so you know for us it kind of really helps us just be that amazing foundation and and then kind of accelerate from there i love the content's kind of the engine that makes everything run i always say content's the oxygen for the marketing team like everybody kind of needs it you don't always see it but you feel it and you need it I'm encouraged by that perspective because I think so many times people over index on measuring content by like form fills or just like very raw, like lead gen, or they say, we're not going to measure anything from content. It's all brand. It's all thought leadership. And it sounds like you, you found a way to weave it into everything the marketing team is doing. So that's, that's really powerful and really insightful. We try to look at multiple things. So it is, you know, do people get to the end of an article necessarily, or do they read it? One good area for us has been talking at events. So we've, been you know lucky enough to kind of be invited to and also you know feature at some events and just asking people for feedback on the things you're saying like does this resonate does it work and you know even in communities just um doing that and a, a great thing I know it's not technically content but it's kind of on your web pages we've been working with winter to get a good view of like 
you know, with regards to our page, like, does it resonate with you? Do we even make sense? Turns out some of our pages didn't, which is always good to know because then you can change them. Um, so it's actually getting that ready feedback from other people and just asking those questions and like the whole, you know, asking people where they found you. You sometimes get people say, oh, I saw that crazy lady on the stage talking on and on about brand and demand. I was, I was really interested. So you, know, you actually start to get a different picture from what you can attribute, which is always, you know, one element of the story. I've become a huge fan of self-reported attribution. I just think that's the way to go with everything you've mentioned at this point, the communities, the stage, the events, all of that. I think that's a big takeaway here. Well, Carol, I'm curious, you mentioned the rebrand that you all went through. I think, um, you know, probably rare, the amount of investment that needs to be made in brand to go through a rebrand process. There's probably not a lot of businesses doing that considering the macro conditions you've kind of spoken to over the last two years. How did you build trust within the organization that now was the right time and this was the right investment to be made despite everything going on around us? I was hired obviously by the the sort of P firm when they, they bought Exclaimer and um, and they were very aware that actually what had got our company to where we were, you know, was great. It was performing. They had great reasons for buying it. But what we needed to do was to shift from where we were, which was very much a utility. We were viewed as a, you know, an IT utility. If you buy um, email signatures, I always say you buy them either for brand protection or you buy them for brand promotion. And we index very heavily on the brand protection, which is like, you know, you want a secure compliance signature, probably if you're rebranding, because you want to make sure that everything's well represented. It's, it's up to date you know you've got the legal elements in your signature and you've not got any risks there so a lot of people buy it for that that's brilliant that will always happen but actually if you want to take what we do somewhere you look at it as a brand promotion tool so it's how can you you know serve the right content to the right people at the right time how can you bring in your content into your signatures how can you represent what people have seen in this lovely amazing journey that you've done with your ABM and your advertising and your messaging that then drops down because the salesperson sending an email from their account that doesn't represent so it's actually how can you promote all the areas of your brand not just you know it looking really good and you know amazing and the right typeface and all all the kind of things that annoy you as a designer you know I think it's just that element of how important brand can be in terms of driving growth and it just think it really underpins everything you do so I kind of came in luckily with the kind of backing of the company that we had to to make that shift to appeal to marketers we couldn't look like an IT utility tool we had to make a difference we had to stand for something We had to have really good like positioning, messaging, make sure we knew who we were and what we stood for and who we were targeting. And luckily we didn't have a lot of that. So, you know, I think if someone came in now, you'd struggle to rebrand as hopefully you wouldn't need to. But, you know, when you don't have any of that and you don't have what I kind of build to the board as like a scalable architecture that we can then build on as we grow the company and as we evolve, then we're in a difficult position. And you have to look at brand as more than just kind of, you know, the how your product looks. It's like, how does it feel? Do people trust you? Do they, you know, understand what you're doing, what you're selling? You know, it also goes through to everything that happens. You know, when we look at measuring the impact of our brand, we look at things like Glassdoor reviews, we look at our socials, we look at do our employees, you know, feel passionate about the brand that they want to interact with it because all of these elements just magnify your success and they're almost intangible, but you're actually bringing people on board, motivating them, helping them be part of that journey as well for a rebound helps its success. But I think it's just being clear, like what are all the things actually that you measure brand in that you maybe don't think about because it is important. So we went through a lot of that journey with our board and also kind of articulating it to our CEO to help them understand that actually the kind of impact while we couldn't guarantee and say you'll get a 10x return on this happening we could model how that would look like and what the other elements that it would also impact on as well and and sort of how that would help us stand out in the marketplace and also with what we did have we didn't have enough to to sort of perform in that kind of next level you know you want to go to sell to enterprise you have to be really really good at articulating your brand so I love that brand so much more than logo, colors, fonts. And I think getting the employee input is really valuable, but I think that's also a sneaky, powerful way to build buy-in when you do introduce the new brand. It's not just the marketing team's brand, right? It's it's everybody's. And I think that's really critical um, to build a brand that not only your customers love, but also your team loves. That's great input there. Well, the last question we always like asking all of our guests, what is one unpopular opinion you have as it pertains to B2B marketing? 
I don't know if I have any hugely unpopular opinions. I think maybe the whole thing that you actually genuinely will fall over and not ever kind of succeed in the long term, which is probably quite unpopular with CEOs and CFOs. But, you know, unless you do invest in that that brand and, and invest in being, you know, as a marketer, I think we get away with a few things, but you have to be authentic. You have to stand up and live by your promises. So I think that, that sort of, you know, brand and demand, a lot of people say, you know, you just do great demand gen, the world will, you know, everything will be, fine and you get loads of leads just don't get your content and it'll all be good I don't think that works without you know the heart and soul behind it to really underpin everything so I guess I'm kind of like a an avid brand supporter in that side despite being you know growing up in a demand gen and growth hacking kind of generation I think a lot of people sort of say well if you just do great targeting and great ads you know the world will fall at your feet but I think it is the little things and the good things and having you know everyone bought in and on the same journey that really makes a difference. I love that. So much to learn there. Well, Carol, if people want to learn more from you or about Exclaimer, what is the best way to do that? I'm always on LinkedIn. It's Carol Howley. So if you look at me on LinkedIn.com, you can find me quite easily. So always on LinkedIn. And I don't really use Twitter as much as I used to anymore. I was actually having a conversation with someone about that the other day, but I always used to say on Twitter, but I do respond if anyone follows me on Twitter too. Well, Carol, thank you so much for joining us today. To all of our listeners and watchers, thanks for joining another episode of the Content Cocktail Hour. Until next time, cheers. Thank you for joining the Content Cocktail Hour powered by The Juice. If you want to see more episodes or more resources curated for your role, join us on app.thejuicehq.com. See you next time. Same time, same place. Cheers.